You are listening to a Higher Things production. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents The Uncultured Saints with Pastors Eli Leedsow and Harrison Goodman. You've probably seen your at the wrong tempo. I probably at the wrong pitch. I can't actually tell for what sure. What happened but... to that? That isn't on anymore. It's not? No. Good. It was on the very first uh, uh, video one, mm-hmm. and then it hasn't been uh, has it been on since. We'll uh, we'll see if we can fix it for this season. Uh, we're the uncultured saints, right? Yeah, yeah, we are. You know uh, it. Back again for season. I don't even know what season anymore. It's just so long. It's season like purgatory. Season del cinco. Del cinco is that what we're calling it now? I think it is. All right, it's of the five. The of the five. Uh, yeah, that's what del means. As far as my Spanish goes. Mine goes to El Baño, but like. <laughs> Good. After Voya Vomitar, I got nothing. Um, so how you been, buddy? I'm okay. Why is your cup yellow? I've never seen a yellow cup before like that. I don't know. Somebody got it. I think they got it uh, during Easter time. We got a bunch. We got like pastel purple and a pink one that I don't like. I try because uh, I have a cup of water uh, uh, all the time up in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, I was trying to go liturgical. That's obviously the thing that you should do just so, for yourself. Yeah, right. So I'd have the green cup, and then I have the blue. Uh, oh, so you could actually take like a dramatic pause during the sermon <laughs> that nobody else actually wanted to hear from you. <laughs> and here's guy, my here's my white solo cup on Transfiguration Sunday. <laughs> I'm glad that you're uh, you're keeping it uh, all things in their place. Um, <laughs> in good order. That's what yeah, we do. Yeah. Good and perfect order. Yeah, I, I know that the uh, the apostles were hoping for solo cups. <laughs> they were. That's in the days were. of martyrdom. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, as, as Peter was uh, uh, being crucified upside down. <laughs> it's like they better get those solo cups right. I'm not dying for nothing. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> it was the anti-meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do anything for love, but I would do that. I would do that. Awesome. Okay, so we've ruined this season already, too. Nowhere to go but up. Uh, let's talk about the Gospel of St. Mark. That's what we're doing. Yeah, it's the short one, right? It's the short yeah. one with the weird, uh, maybe, kind of, sort of, abrupt ending. But as uh, LCMS Lutherans, we better not say it has an abrupt ending, right? I- I, 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 on the historic lectionary, it sort of does. I love it, though, the way it ends there. Um, I yeah, guess, though, so, no, because they'll pick it up and they'll keep going as the, the season goes. Yeah, well, let's just start at the, the beginning uh, or or the part that's not even at the beginning because it's an abrupt it's an abrupt beginning just as much as it's an abrupt ending. Yeah. Um, we don't I, get Christmas. Uh, somehow, Mark has literally stolen Christmas from the children. Mark is the Grinch. Um uh, yeah, it's kind of, well, okay, so maybe we should kind of set up uh, uh, as uh, uh, as least boring as possible, um, to talking about how uh, commentators talk about uh, the book of uh, Mark and the Gospels as a whole when they're, when they're sitting in their rooms uh, uh, discussing things that nobody else cares about. Um, so if, if you ask uh, the, uh, the average, not uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod uh, commentator, uh, uh, kind of the orders of when the books were written. Uh, most say that Mark is written first, right? And most say, well, Mark is written first. Why? Because there's not that stuff. It so, ap- yeah, it appears yeah. to be the shortest. It appears to be the simplest. It's just kind of boom, 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 boom. Like here, here are all of your bullet points and now we're done. Mm-hmm. And then, so then everybody is assuming, well, that was the first one written. And then, People like Matthew and, and they Luke, added to it, right? They came along, they embellished it, 
or mm -hmm. added more details, if you don't want to go with the embellishing of words, uh, added more details to the accounts. Um, and then that's why those are a bit, a little bit longer, a little bit more extravagant. Right. So you kind of have two choices then when you deal with this. Either um, there is not Christmas in this story because Christmas had not been invented yet, um, or there is not Christmas in the story because everybody already knows about Christmas, but the point of this story is not Christmas. Um, it, it assumes Christmas, uh, but but it, it is not there to tell Christmas. Uh, and those those actually really matter. If, if the Gospels are sort of you know growing in, in complexity and confession, if uh, the virgin birth is not actually something that the earliest Christians believed in, that would that would say something. Um, but if the earliest Christians had already heard from, I don't know, say the gospel of Matthew, all of these things, then as Mark sits down to tell his tale, um, he can, he can actually bank on the fact that people have actually heard about this stuff before, and he can drive at the points that are really important to him, which might also be why Mark is a little bit more, sh uh, uh, short and, and a whole lot more, uh, directly focused at the cross of Christ. Right. Yeah, and I think I think that that gives a more compelling uh, argument. And again, scholars are going to debate one way or the other. But um, with the with the understanding or thought process going in, saying, okay, Mark might, might maybe Mark was the second one, or or maybe even the third one written, um, with Matthew being the first, and then maybe Luke coming after that. Um, then it then you can have the good answer of, oh, this is why. Christmas isn't in there. This is because it's already been told twice. This this is this is why the temptation, uh, and I think we're going to try and get to that uh, today. The temptation is much shorter. You don't have the specifics of Christ's temptation in the desert like you do with Matthew and, and Luke. Oh well, you already had those, and and that's assumed that the that the hearer and the reader has already understood and heard these things so and mark that, isn't taking the time to go through every single detail because then the sermon would take too long like this podcast exactly mm. exactly 100 smarter than us which, which which yeah which also might then lend itself when we get there in chapter 16 to the maybe quasi abrupt ending um uh, because perhaps uh uh mark isn't writing just a uh uh note by note uh textual uh, history book, right? But perhaps it is more of a homily. Perhaps it is more of a, uh, uh, we've got the history before with Matthew and Luke, and now I'm, I'm using that truth of what happened in time and space with Christ. Um, but then I'm, I'm trying to drive a specific point to it. Right. Um, so when we kind of get to deal with this, uh, I think maybe just the place to start would be uh, where where Mark does then. Um, we, we know that there is such a thing as Christmas because we have uh, Matthew uh, and, and Luke and, and really John uh, it, it, all telling us that, that God was made man. But Mark just sort of starts with why. Uh, the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And wait, we can go into it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Did we talk about who Mark was? Who is Mark? Does that matter? Yes. <laughs> we well, we hear about Mark a little bit in the Book of Acts, right? And he's he kind of hangs out a little bit with with Paul, and I think it does, he that he doesn't, and then he's hanging out with Peter, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he very. It's interesting. Mark, uh, uh, along with Luke, it, see Matthew, of course, is one mm -hmm. of the apostles who, who walked uh, around with Jesus. Mark and, and John too. And John too, right? Um, or John also, not not like John the the, the sequel. Right, correct. People people yeah. argue about weird stuff in the Bible. <laughs> right, yeah, not 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 the not his epistle. Um, but um, do you ever get like a dog and name it after the dog that you used to have? Like, I have a dog named Goob, but if I got another dog, could I name him Goob too? Or is that Goob too? Is that verboten? Goob, is that a nap? Goob the redo. Yeah, the redux. The right. Yeah. yeah, I think you could do that. Hmm. Um. But Sorry. Eddie, no, that's okay. Uh, but Mark and Luke, they're they're coming, uh, not even a generation, but they're, they're coming kind of on the heels of of this. Um, they they've been to, uh, disciples. They've they've uh, been at the feet of the apostles. Um, and some will argue and or, or or put forward that that maybe a lot of Mark's uh, gospel is um, is kind of a, a focused on on Peter and and his accounts. Right. So it's it's kind of uh, Mark sitting there with Peter kind of at the end of Peter's life um, and uh, kind of transcribing uh, the gospel in, in that way, which <clears throat> is kind of an interesting, 
interesting perspective and way to look at it. It kind of matters though, because the it's not only sort of were they there, were they were they actual witness to, to these things. I, I regretted it as soon as I said it. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's they were also. There. It's also a matter of, yeah, they were, uh, they get to sing the hymn, but uh, it didn't just cause them to tremble. Uh, it, it, that's that's maybe something to talk about another day. Uh, maybe we should do a season on hymns when uh, we really want to have people not listen anymore. Right. Um, that's something for the for the future. It, it's also a question of authority. Like, who are you to, to, to speak on behalf of God? for the entirety of those whom he would have believe. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of one thing to anybody can say a thing that's true, but there really is such a thing as, as were you sent to say this thing? Um, because that, that actually matters. It's not just sort of a question of, of logistics, like uh, too many cooks in the kitchen. We can't all give the announcements at once. We should, we should appoint somebody, but, but there actually is a, a, a weight of, of authority that comes to, to proclaiming this for you, for the forgiveness of your sins that you would believe and have eternal life. And so it, it matters that the apostles are actually supposed to be writing these things. Uh, and so when you have ones like, um, you know, uh, Mark, or Luke, who are they attached to? And, and on, on whose authority are they writing? Because they were not one of the 12. Um, the, the church has, has sort of always tied uh, Mark to St. Peter and Luke to St. Paul. Am I right? Yeah, I think so. And then also I, I've, I've heard as well, uh, I can't remember if I heard this at the seminary, um, but uh, uh, Luke's, um, the way in which Luke uh, tells uh, the Christmas story, uh, mm. he, he very well might have uh, uh, had a couple sit downs with Mary. Uh, hmm. Just, just the way in which, uh, and and not giving Mary an apostolic position, but it, it is, it is a very you hear about in Luke, right? Mary's pondering all of these things in her heart, like sure. a mother would, um, mm -hmm. and it would only make sense that kind of some of those details would uh, uh, perhaps come from not as if he's writing word for word what Mary put down, but sure, I've I've talked with Mary a couple different times about what happened, and I'll, I'll include some of her, her. Uh, input i so, don't know now we're just speckling but. yeah i i like speckling but um <laughs> what's the uh the purpose of mark then i i think if we're gonna start to to do this because we we've established that you know he he's he's talking about things uh, we at least believe he's talking about things that have already been talked about to a people that have already heard them on behalf of another guy who already saw them why do we why do we bother well, you had said it, it, it seems to be like a sprint to the cross, which which I kind of like. Um, and I think we could see that there. Uh, but also, I think some other things, I think Mark, um, Mark is, I don't think it's as simple as, as, uh, as some mm -hmm. scholars want to say. But he's really actually pretty in depth. And he's got some some reasons why he does things literarily and, and, and like that. Um, and he's portraying and when i say he's portraying jesus i, I that's not to say like uh, he's portraying jesus this way and jesus wasn't no he was and this is what mark is trying to get across he's portraying jesus like in, in a number of different lights so jesus is going to be uh he's going to be the messiah he's going to be the son he's going to be israel reduced to one he's going to be standing in the sinner's place and all of this is going to be happening all the time in in mark and and changing really quickly uh, where uh, two verses ago, you're going to see a, a clear, you are the son of God. And then here you've got him, what? But now he's standing as one of the sinners hmm. um, in the place of. And and so to see this all over the place, I think is is kind of neat. So I think, again, I think Mark is is is, is trying to do a, a lot of stuff. And, and we uh, way oversimplify it when we just say he's, uh, the earliest and the first guy and uh, the dummy in the room. I don't think he was. It's it's actually. I mean, just by listening to this podcast, you can you can tell it's harder to be precise than to just sort of ramble and fill up time. Uh, Mark is precise. <laughs> he's he's pretty good at it. He he gets right to the quick of it. Um, and, and it matters. You actually see this in the Apostles' Creed. Um, in in the Apostles' Creed, when we talk about Jesus, we don't mention all of his miracles. We, we don't uh, mention every single thing that he did, uh, but but rather, what are the things that have to do with your salvation? Um, Mark is is shaped in a lot of ways very similarly to the Apostles' Creed in that it's not that these things didn't happen. It's not that we just hadn't figured out that they should be talked about. But, but as Mark 
speaks, as he preaches, as, 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 he, as he writes this gospel that would be received by the church for all generations until Christ comes again, uh, the things that he is concerned with, they are the things of salvation. And so when, when he starts with Jesus, uh, God was made man for a purpose. It was not just to walk with me and talk with me. It, it was not just to give me basic instructions before leaving earth. It was not to do any sort of evangelical bumper sticker-esque kind of thing. It was to die for my sins and rise again for my salvation. And so as we start, we start then with, with the baptizer baptizing for, with, for uh, repentance and the forgiveness of sins, right? Yeah. Um, I think uh, because, uh, and, 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 and maybe you disagree, but I think because uh, we're not trying to get through a, an entire chapter and, and all of that, and we are specifically, uh, and we're not going to go verse by verse, but because we are going to be kind of p- picking out specific differences that Mark has, it probably would lend, uh, uh, it would be good if, if we kind of read through the section that we're just going to be talking about. I love it. That, that way we're just not saying, hey, when Jesus uh, was baptized, and then in your mind, you've got Luke's version and Matthew's version and Mark's version without hearing Mark's version. And more right. often than not, we don't sort of have Mark's version in, in our in our minds. So no. that, that's probably good. We're reading from the ESV, right? Uh, that's what I am. Let's yeah. go. Uh, okay, I'll read uh, the first little section and maybe, yeah, and then you can com- uh, commentate a little bit on it. So, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That ends right at verse 8 there. So inside of that, we, we I don't want to do the whole thing based on what we don't get. I want to talk about what we do have because it, it, it's not that, that Mark is, is forgetful. It's the stuff that he wants in there. He wants in there for a very explicit purpose. John was out baptizing for a reason. It was not just sort of the next flashy thing. It was not sort of the next act of penance. It was the forgiveness of sins. What was John doing? He was forgiving the sinners. Why did Jesus go out there to become a sinner? Yeah, uh, I think, no, absolutely. Um, uh, And I think uh, you you might have uh, 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 given a little bit of a spoiler there when we're going to get to his baptism. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. (laughs) And uh, don't ever dance like that again. (laughs) Um, but i i I like how uh how mark starts this all of he does tell us why he's why he's writing this right this is the gospel Mm -hmm. it's the gospel Mm -hmm. of 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 jesus christ uh it's the gospel of the messiah uh he is the son of god uh and he is yahweh right because uh he's quoting isaiah there and in quoting isaiah at the very end right even though he's uh kind of alluding this part of isaiah is alluding to um uh to john the baptist right uh, but it says right at the end there, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, uh, obviously, Isaiah, when he says, says Lord there, he's speaking Yahweh. And yet when Mark is uh, describing this, it's like, well, John came on the scene and right after him came Jesus. And John is preparing the way of the Lord, i.e. Jesus is Yahweh. Mm. It's God in the flesh right here already. And it, for us, I think we could uh, uh, just kind of gloss over this so quickly, but I think Mark, like like you said earlier, in his very succinct way, Mark is is already uh, laying out a number of things, and he's already made some major claims. Christ Jesus is the Messiah, and he's God in the flesh. And that's the the explicit purpose of the Christmas narrative too. That that uh, Jesus being born of a virgin, it not being something that you see every day, is a testament to to the incarnation, to God being made man. And and so Mark almost sort of steps it forward and says, why? Why would God become like us? Why would God enter this creation? This place is awful. You guys, look around. It's terrible. Everybody's dying all the time. Everybody's sinning all the time. Why is he here? Um, My vicar just uh, pulled up and he's trying to show me up uh, because I uh, I park right by the door so I don't have to walk so far. 
and he parks all the way at the other corner of the parking lot and then he saunters across the park i uh, hope the other thing that he does is um help the uh the handicapped uh people who cannot get into the building because your car is like up on the curb now <laughs> i hope that he's he's also helping them into the building right because they took their spots yeah, yeah. sorry go ahead so Jesus actually comes for this purpose to to save us sinners uh, who, who would steal the handicapped uh, parking spaces right. from the handicapped. Yeah, uh, the whole country of Judea uh, is going out to be baptized by John, confessing their sins. Um, we we sort of recognize this this story, but what's sort of magnified by it is is John immediately in, in Mark starts to talk about the mightier one, the the, the purer one, the one whose sandal we can't even untie. Uh, this is a baptism that is only for sinners, and the person coming down into the water is the person who has no sin, who is greater than the baptizer, who who is the one who who if anybody should not be here, it's him. Who, yeah, who yeah, not be here. yeah. In a in a moment, in a moment, that's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But right now, John's just. John's being who? He's being Elijah. I know. I you keep going to Jesus baptism. I'm like, no, nah, well, not yet. No, we'll, let's we'll just... get there. We'll get there in a moment. I love it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so so John, and we're not going to go into all the details. But John, he's he's uh, he's the picture of Elijah, right? He's he's mm -hmm. standing there. He's the prophet's prophet. He's standing there dressed like Elijah. When you go back to the Old Testament, you hear how Elijah dressed, the things that he ate, it, it, all of that sort of stuff. It's John the Baptist is clearly standing in the stead. Now, whether this was throughout all time, uh, just kind of known to be what the prophets wore and what the prophets ate, I don't know. But it is pretty clear that he's he's standing kind of like Elijah did, which is a big deal. And we hear later on uh, uh, as well, people thinking that perhaps uh, uh, John, well, Jesus says this, right? That uh, John is uh, uh, the greater Elijah and all that. Mm -hmm. it, so, it's good. No, no. No, I was just going to jump into the uh, to the the repentance whole idea, right? Mm. Um, so he is uh, as as an Old Testament prophet and as the last Old Testament prophet, right? The last prophet coming here, uh, he's doing what all the other prophets are doing, and what all the other prophets are doing, they're called to bring the people to repentance and point forward to the Messiah. And so the, his act of baptizing, while it isn't the same. Uh, uh, baptism that we would know as the Christian baptism, like you said, it was for the forgiveness of sins, and it did initiate repentance. So it wasn't, it, even here at this section, it, it was not, uh, people, you better repent first, and then you can go ahead and get baptized. It was no, even here in John's baptism, uh, God is repenting the people uh, initiated through this baptism, uh, he's forgiving the people's sins, and he's doing all of that to what? To make the people ready for Jesus. Jesus. This is this is the initiation for the people of Israel. You must be cleansed before God comes into your midst, and I'm going to cleanse you. This is God uh, doing all the work. Right. So this is, an, is a God who, who has to work through means. Um, because if, if he is a God who has to cleanse you himself before he can be among you, he can't show up and do it himself, except he has to be the one who does it himself. And so we have a God who works through means. It's, it's wonderful if you start to think about it, because it shows that your baptism is actually doing something. It's not just sort of your, I pledge allegiance to the Jesus. But if, if God has to be the one who cleanses you before God can be around you. And so when God uses agents, when God uses people and stuff to accomplish things, they do the things that he wants. And so God spoke through John the baptizer. God baptized through water. And, and in the reception of that baptism, the people actually were made clean. They, they did receive the things that they would need so that they could confront uh, the, the reality of, of uh, the mercies of God. It means something because now when we start to, to confront our own baptisms, when we start to, to deal with the, the realities of Christian life, because I, I, I I love the the narratives of the Bible stories because it's it's a problem solved and then you never hear from the people again. So you get to write your own ending. Um, you, right? The lepers are healed and so nothing bad ever happens to them again. The never. end. Right. Lazarus is raised from the dead and definitely not martyred later. Uh, you, you know, the, the when we have the the people going out to to be baptized with repentance for the forgiveness of sins, we get to sort of tell us our, ourselves that all right now they're now they're faithful and they're not gonna they're not gonna stumble they're not gonna backslide they're not gonna wrestle with unbelief or doubt or, or shame. Uh, everything's just, just hunky dory. Um, and then I get to look at my own baptism and, and all of the messes that I have made since the font and, and recognize it is still God working in that font. 
to forgive my sins. It is still God working to to daily make me holy and and, and clean before Him. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah. Wonderful. Can Jesus get baptized yet? Yeah, I guess so. Let's do Thanks. it. All right. Well, finally. Yeah. Ugh, it's been so long. Let's and then it. it happened, and uh, a voice talked again. It's real short. Uh, the You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So Jesus goes to receive the sinner's baptism, even though he's not a sinner. Um, and, and God is pleased by this. This was not a mistake. Uh, Jesus goes where only the sinners go to do something that only the sinners need. And it's pleasing to the Father. Uh, because in this this act, uh, you have you have Jesus then assuming our sin. You have Jesus assuming th- the role, the stance, the representative uh, of the sinner. Yeah, so I think. Sorry, I cut you off. Go. He's going to have to do something with that sin, right? Eventually, yeah. Um, I think here better than uh, better is the wrong word, but I'm going to use it. Be heretic. Better than Matthew and and Luke. I think uh, here Mark does kind of speak of of jesus uh in his baptism because we all get it jesus didn't need to be baptized in and of himself he didn't have to have his sins forgiven but this is kind of where the uh a two-part thing part of his act of righteousness here is 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 being the uh, an israelite and and listening and heeding uh the the word of the prophet even though he specifically didn't need his uh, sins forgiven but then it's also his passover as luther kind of talks about it is his um uh, uh, and how do we talk about it? the great reversal, the great exchange, right? Now Jesus is standing, he's taking the place right away. Mark has Jesus standing in the place of the sinner because we know that the only place, uh, the only person who should be in the water is the sinner. And here we've got Jesus as the first individual that we get to hear standing in the water, even though we know he's not a sinner, he's standing in the place of the sinner. So Mark does a great job with that, but then he also does uh, some interesting things with um, with the with the language that Matthew and Luke don't do. Um, uh, right before that, so um, in verse uh, in verse ten, uh, where mm-hmm. Mark writes, "And when he Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove." <clears throat> Our English translation use uh, opening. Um, the Greek is actually ripping asunder, mm-hmm. tearing apart, right? So it's uh, it's tearing apart the heavens. Uh, it, it almost kind of sounds like a violent thing. Mark is violent because as soon as this is done, it's immediately the spirit drove him out into the wilderness. Like the right. same way that, that Jesus drove out the money changers in the temple. Um, it, yeah. It's, there, there's a, a you don't get a choice in this, and we're not going to be casual about it. Yeah, and and uh, there just two other things that I wanted to mention here. We may mm. not even get to, to to temptation, which might be fine because I don't want to bull rush it through the temptation in two minutes. You would um, hate to do that, like Mark does, right? Right. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do. It. Um, just one interesting thing is that Terry to Sunder word. Uh, it's mm. used here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it's it's used at the end when when the curtain is torn in two. Hmm. We've we've got kind of the, these book these bookends of this tearing asunder is that same word that's used and then that, sorry go ahead no that's a really really cool opening and closing because in in this particular uh, narrative of of the baptism of Jesus not everybody sees the voice uh, the the voice uh, not everybody sort of gets to to behold the heavens being torn asunder this way only Jesus does but in the in the crucifixion when the temple is 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 uh, the curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom now that the holy of holies is exposed to all of the people now that the sins are forgiven now we all get to uh, hear the the same very voice from heaven uh, because this this Jesus who is God become man has taken away our sins has actually uh, been pleasing to the Father in such a way that even now you and I are pleasing to the Father. We get to hear the very same promise that Jesus first heard because he was baptized and carried that all the way to the cross. That's a really, really cool thing. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And I, and I love how uh, Mark continues just being a little bit different than, than Luke, because like you said, um, uh, when the spirit descends on him in, in verse 10, again, our English uh, translates a, a particular participle on, and that's how Luke and Matthew talk about it. But the actual participle is almost always translated into this is almost like a possession sort of thing like the spirit mm-hmm. is coming into jesus right at mm-hmm. this baptism right mm-hmm. anointing him as this uh, as this christ this messiah and then like you said uh because the spirit is in him uh he doesn't have he doesn't have a, a almost doesn't have a choice that's that's not 
uh, kind of muddy those waters. But there is this idea that, no, the Spirit's going to be doing something here. Um, that that Mark and Luke, and maybe we can leave it as a teaser, that Mark and Luke kind of describe it as different. And and last thing, I know I've been talking a lot, so next mm. time you're going to talk a lot. Um, mm. <clears throat> last, uh, I think oftentimes, and this kind of goes back to the the initial thing of uh, the, the gospel writers uh, giving things that are a little bit different and maybe not contradictory, but not exactly the same. And then people are like, well, see, this means that the Bible, the, each gospel writer couldn't, couldn't agree. And I think it's, it's, it, we should better hear it as, uh, can both of these things be happening at once? Can our right. Lord actually be trying to describe and do and, and show more than just one thing? And maybe that's why the gospel readings are pulling out these particular things. Matthew's already said this about the baptism of Jesus, which was true. So I'm going to say this about the baptism of Jesus, which is also true at the same time. And it's driving to different points, even just sort of recognizing that the spirit has a role in this. And you, you you flirted with that line just the right way, because it's not that the son doesn't have a choice, but it's that the spirit has a will that the son of God be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And the father has a will that the son of God be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And the son of God has a will that the son of God would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. All three uh, persons of the Trinity are united in will here. And you actually get a little bit to sort of see uh, the, the the economy of the Trinity, the, the, the way that the, the persons of the Trinity operate uh, amongst it and, and with and and in each other and all the sort of um, Athanasian creedal ways that we talk about it. Right. Uh, but but everybody's involved. This is not just the Jesus show. And this is also not sort of like the, the angry, abusive uh, father who, who takes out every bit of wrath on one child and, and not the others, but but rather this is the entirety of the Trinity united in will and force and action to save us sinners. Yeah, it's beautiful. We get to see the the, the Trinity at play here. Uh, we're going to see, I believe, uh, uh, next time we're going to see the uh, the two uh, uh, the two natures in, uh, uh, in in the person of Christ as well. We're going to see his uh, divine nature and his, his human nature playing out side by side, which is awesome. That'll be fun. Um, you listener, come back and uh, and do that. You Singular. talking to you. We out. Good.